This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. The Child and Its Enemies by Emma Goldman Is the child to be considered as an individuality, or as an object to be moulded according to the whims and fancies of those about it? This seems to me to be the most important question to be answered by parents and educators, and whether the child is to grow from within, whether all that craves expression will be permitted to come forth toward the light of day, or whether it is to be needed like dough through external forces, depends on the proper answer to this vital question. The longing of the best the noblest of our times makes for the strongest individualities. Every sensitive being abhors the idea of being treated as a mere machine, or as a mere parrot of conventionality and respectability. The human being craves recognition of his kind. It must be borne in mind that it is through the channel of the child that the development of the mature man must go, and that the present ideas of the educating or training of the latter in the school and the family, even the family of the liberal or radical, are such as to stifle the natural growth of the child. Every institution of our day, the family, the state, our moral codes, sees in every strong, beautiful, uncompromising personality a deadly enemy. Therefore, every effort is being made to cramp human emotion and originality of thought in the individual into a straitjacket from its earliest infancy, or to shape every human being according to one pattern, not into a well-rounded individual, but into a patient work-slave, professional automaton, tax-paying citizen, or righteous moralist. If one, nevertheless, meets with real spontaneity, which, by the way, is a rare treat, it is not due to our method of rearing or educating the child, the personality often asserts itself, regardless of official and family barriers. Such a discovery should be celebrated as an unusual event, since the obstacles placed in the way of growth and development of character are so numerous that it must be considered a miracle if it retains its strength and beauty, and survives the various attempts at crippling that which is most essential to it. Indeed, he who has freed himself from the fetters of the thoughtlessness and stupidity of the commonplace, he who can stand with moral crutches, without the approval of public opinion, private laziness, Friedrich Nietzsche called it, may well intone a high and voluminous song of independence and freedom. He has gained the right to it through fierce and fiery battles. These battles already begin at the most delicate age. The child shows its individual tendencies in its plays, in its questions, in its association with people and things, but it has to struggle with everlasting external interference in its world of thought and emotion. It must not express itself in harmony with its nature, with its growing personality. It must become a thing, an object. Its questions are met with narrow, conventional, ridiculous replies, mostly based on falsehoods, and when, with large, wandering, innocent eyes, it wishes to behold the wonders of the world, those about it quickly lock the windows and doors, and keep the delicate human plant in a hothouse atmosphere, where it can neither breathe nor grow freely. Zola, in his novel Fecundity, maintains that large sections of people have declared death to the child, have conspired against the birth of the child, a very horrible picture indeed, yet the conspiracy entered into by civilization against the growth and making of character seems to me far more terrible and disastrous because of the slow and gradual destruction of its latent qualities and traits and the stupefying and crippling effect thereof upon its social well-being. Since every effort in our educational life seems to be directed toward making of the child a being foreign to itself, it must of necessity produce individuals foreign to one another, and in everlasting antagonism with each other. The ideal of the average pedagogist is not a complete, well-rounded, original being, rather does he seek that the result of his art of pedagogy shall be automatons of flesh and blood, to best fit into the treadmill of society and the emptiness and dullness of our lives. Every home, school, college, and university stands for dry, cold utilitarianism, over-flooding the brain of the pupil with tremendous amounts of ideas handed down from generations past. Facts and data, as they are called, constitute a lot of information, well enough perhaps to maintain every form of authority and to create much awe for the importance of possession, but only a great handicap to a true understanding of the human soul and its place in the world. Truths dead and long forgotten, conceptions of the world and its people, covered with mould, even during the times of our grandmothers, are being hammered into the heads of our young generation. Eternal change, thousandfold variations, continual innovation are the essence of life. 
Professional pedagogy knows nothing of it. The systems of education are being arranged into files, classified and numbered. They lack the strong, fertile seed which, falling on rich soil, enables them to grow to great heights. They are worn and incapable of awakening spontaneity of character. Instructors and teachers with dead souls operate with dead values. Quantity is forced to take the place of quality. The consequences thereof are inevitable. In whatever direction one turns, eagerly searching for human beings who do not measure ideas and emotions with a yardstick of expediency, one is confronted with the products, the herd-like drilling instead of the result of spontaneous and innate characteristics working themselves out in freedom. No traces now I see, whatever of a spirit's agency, tis drilling, nothing more. These words of Faust fit our methods of pedagogy perfectly. Take, for example, the way history is being taught in our schools. See how the events of the world become like a cheap puppet show, where a few wire pullers are supposed to have directed the course of the development of the entire human race. And the history of our own nation. What is not chosen by Providence to become the leading nation on Earth? And does it not tower mountain high over other nations? Is it not the gem of the ocean? Is it not incomparably virtuous, ideal, and brave? The result of such ridiculous teaching is a dull shadow patriotism, blinded to its own limitations, with bull-like stubbornness, utterly incapable of judging of the capacities of other nations. This is the way the spirit of youth is emasculated, deadened through an overestimation of one's own value. No wonder public opinion can be so easily manufactured. Pre-digested food should be inscribed over every hall of learning as a warning to all who do not wish to lose their own personalities and the original sense of judgment who, instead, should be content with a large amount of empathy and shallow shells. This may suffice as a recognition of the manifold hindrances placed in a way of an independent mental development of the child. Equally numerous, and not less important, are the difficulties that confront the emotional life of the young. Must not one suppose that parents should be united to children by the most tender and delicate cords? One should suppose it, yet, sad as it may be, it is, nevertheless true, that parents are the first to destroy the inner riches of their children. The scriptures tell us that God created man in his own image, which has by no means proven a success. Parents follow the bad example of their heavenly master. They use every effort to shape and mould the child according to their own image. They tenaciously cling to the idea that the child is merely part of themselves, an idea as false as it is injurious, and which only increases the misunderstanding of the soul of the child, of the necessary consequences of enslavement and subordination thereof. As soon as the first rays of consciousness illuminate the mind and heart of the child, it instinctively begins to compare its own personality with the personality of those about it. How many hard and cold stone cliffs meet its large, wandering gaze? Soon enough it is confronted with the painful reality that it is here only to serve as an inanimate matter for parents and guardians, whose authority alone gives it shape and form. The terrible struggle of the thinking man and women against political, social, and moral conventions owes its origin to the family, where the child is ever compelled to battle against the internal and external use of force. The categorical imperatives, you shall, you must, this is right, this is wrong, this is true, that is false, shower like a violent rain upon the unsophisticated head of the young being, and impress upon its sensibilities that it has to bow before the long-established and hard notions of thoughts and emotions. Yet the latent qualities and instincts seek to assert their own peculiar methods of seeking the foundation of things, of distinguishing between what is commonly called wrong, true, or false. It is bent upon going its own way, since it is composed of the same nerves, muscles, and blood, even as those who assume to direct its destiny. I fail to understand how parents hope that their children will ever grow up into independent self-reliant spirits when they strain every effort to abridge and curtail the various activities of their children, the plus in quality and character which differentiates their offspring from themselves, and by the virtue of which they are eminently equipped carriers of new invigorating ideas. A young delicate tree that is being clipped and cut by the gardener in order to give it an artificial form will never reach the majestic height and the beauty as one allowed to grow in nature and freedom. When the child reaches adolescence, it meets, added to the home and school restrictions, with a vast amount of hard traditions of social morality, 
The cravings of love and sex are met with absolute ignorance by the majority of parents, who consider it as something indecent and improper, something disgraceful, almost criminal, to be suppressed and fought like some terrible disease. The love and tender feelings in the young plant had turned into vulgarity and coarseness through the stupidity of those surrounding it, so that everything fine and beautiful is either crushed altogether or hidden in the innermost depths as a great sin that dares not face the light. What is more astonishing is the fact that parents will strip themselves of everything, or sacrifice everything for the physical well-being of their child, will wake nights and stand in fear and agony before some physical ailment of their beloved one, but will remain cold and indifferent without the slightest understanding before the soul cravings and the yearnings of their child, neither hearing nor wishing to hear the loud knocking of the young spirit that demands recognition. On the contrary, they will stifle the beautiful voice of spring, or a new life of beauty and splendour of love. They will put the long, lean finger of authority upon the tender throat, and not allow vent to the silvery song of the individual growth, or the beauty of character, of the strength of love and human relation, which alone make life worth living. And yet these parents imagine that they mean best for the child, and for aught I know some really do, but their best means an absolute death and decay to the bud in the making. After all, they are but imitating their own masters in state, commercial, social, and moral affairs by forcibly suppressing every independent attempt to analyse the ills of society and every sincere effort towards the abolition of these ills. Never able to grasp the eternal truth that every method they employ serves as the greatest impetus to bring forth a greater longing for freedom and a deeper zeal to fight for it. That compulsion is bound to awaken resistance. Every parent and teacher ought to know. Great surprise is being expressed over the fact that the majority of children of radical parents are either altogether opposed to the ideas of the latter, many of them moving along the old antiquated paths, or that they are indifferent to the new thoughts and teachings of social regeneration. And yet there is nothing unusual in that. Radical parents, though emancipated from the belief of ownership in the human soul, still cling tenaciously to the notion that they own the child and that they have the right to exercise their authority over it. So they set out to mould and form the child according to their own conception of what is right and wrong, forcing their ideas upon it with the same vehemence that the average Catholic parent uses. And with the latter, they hold out the necessity before the young to do as I tell you, and not as I do. But the impressionable mind of the child realises early enough that the lives of their parents are in contradiction to the ideas they represent, that like the good Christian who fervently prays on Sunday, yet continues to break the Lord's commands the rest of the week, the radical parent arraigns God, priesthood, church, government, domestic authority, yet continues to adjust himself to the condition he abhors. Just so, the free-thought parent can proudly boast that his son of four will recognise the picture of Thomas Paine or Inga Saul, or that he knows that the idea of God is stupid or that the social democratic father can point to his little girl of six and say, Who wrote the capital, dearie? Karl Marx, pa! Or that the anarchistic mother can make it known that her daughter's name is Louise Michel, Sofia Perovskaya, or that she can recite the revolutionary poems of Herweg, Freilegraf, or Shelley, and that she will point out the faces of Spencer, Bakunin, and Moses Harmon almost anywhere. These aren't by no means exaggerations, they are sad facts that I have met in my experience with radical parents. What are the results of such methods of biasing the mind? The following is the consequence, and not very infrequent either. The child being fed on one-sided set and fixed ideas soon grows weary of rehashing the beliefs of its parents, and it sets out in a quest of new sensations, no matter how inferior or shallow the new experience may be. The human mind cannot endure sameness and monotony, so it happens that the boy or girl, overfed on Thomas Paine, will land in the arms of the church. Or they will vote for imperialism only to escape the drag of economic determinism and scientific socialism. Or that they open a shirt waist factory and cling to their right of accumulating property, only to find relief from the old-fashioned communism of their father. Or that the girl will marry the next best man, provided he can make a living only to run away with the everlasting talk on variety. Such a condition of affairs may be very painful to the parents who wish their children to follow in their path, yet I look upon them as very refreshing and encouraging psychological forces. They are the greatest guarantee that the independent mind, at least, will always resist every external and foreign force exercised over the human heart and head. Some will ask, what about weak natures? Must they not be protected? Yes. 
But to be able to do that, it will be necessary to realise that education of children is not synonymous with herd-like drilling and training. If education should really mean anything at all, it must insist upon the free growth and development of the innate forces and tendencies of the child. In this way alone, we can hope for the free individual, and eventually also a free community, which shall make interference and coercion of human growth impossible. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.